In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. I welcome all to St Mary's Basilica for the celebration of our Mass to inaugurate Professor Francis Campbell as Vice-Chancellor of the University of Notre Dame, Australia. I acknowledge can celebrating with me Auxiliary Bishop of Sydney and Archbishop's Liaison for Tertiary Education, the Most Reverend Richard Umbers, the Auxiliary Bishop, Most Reverend Terry Brady, the Bishop of Wollongong, the Most Reverend Brian Mascord, and my brother priests, including our National Catholic University treasurer Father John Neal. I recognise Her Excellency, the Governor of New South Wales, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, and Mr Dennis Wilson, having previously served on several benches and tribunals, most recently as President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, Justice Beasley was also a lecturer in Notre Dame School of Law and a member of the School of Law Advisory Board. We're also delighted to welcome her predecessor as Governor, Dame Mari Bashir, another friend of our university. The Consuls General of Croatia, Malaysia, Portugal, Spain and the United States and the Honourable David Scarf, former Ambassador of the Order of Malta to Timor-Leste. From UNDA, I acknowledge the Chancellor, the Honourable Chris Ellison, with former Chancellors Neville Owen, Michael Quinlan, Terry Tobin and Peter Prendival, Deputy Chancellor Michael Lestrange, Governors, Trustees and Directors of the University present and past. The until now Acting Vice-Chancellor Professor Peter Tranter with Vice-Chancellor Emeritus Professor Peter Tannock. Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Professor Margot Kearns with former Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor Professor Hayden Ramsey. And Pro-Chancellors, Pro-Vice-Chancellors, Deans, Professors and other Executive, Academic and General Staff, past and present. Also from the tertiary sector, representatives of the Australian Catholic University, the Catholic Institute of Sydney and Campion College, the CEO of TEXA, Mr Anthony McLaurin, and other academic leaders and staff. Other distinguished guests and friends at the university. But above all, I welcome our incoming Vice-Chancellor, Professor Francis Campbell. A very warm welcome to you all. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. O God, who teach us that you abide in hearts that are just and true, grant that we may be so fashioned by your grace as to become a dwelling place pleasing to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the letter of St. James. Take the case, my brothers, of someone who has never done a single good act, but claims he has faith. Will that faith save him? If one of the brothers or one of the sisters is in need of clothes and has not enough food to live on, and one of you says to them, I wish you well, keep yourself warm and eat plenty without giving them these bare necessities of life, then what good is that? Faith is like that. If good works do not go with it, it is quite dead. This is the way to talk to people of that kind. You say you have faith and I have good deeds. I will prove to you that I have faith by showing you my good deeds. Now you prove to me that you have faith without any good deeds to show. You believe in the one God. That is creditable enough. But the demons have the same belief and they tremble with fear. Do realize, you senseless man, that faith without good deeds is useless. You surely know that Abraham, our father, was justified by his deed because he offered his son Isaac on the altar. There you see it. Faith and deeds were working together. His faith became perfect by what he did. This is what scripture really means when it says, Abraham put his faith in God and this was counted as making him justified. And that, it was, that is why he was called the friend of God. You see now that it is by doing something good and not only by believing that a man is justified. A body dies when it is separated from the spirit. And in the same way, faith is dead if it is separated from good deeds. The word of the Lord. i 
and weather in his house. His justice stands firm forever. His light in the darkness for the upright. His generous, merciful, and just. Happy takes pity and lends. He conducts his affairs with honor. The just man will never waver. He will be remembered forever. no fear of evil news. With a firm heart he trusts in the Lord. With a steadfast heart he will not fear. He will see the downfall of his foes. Happy to the poor. His justice stands firm forever. His head will be raised in glory. Happy are those who do what the Lord The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus called the people and his disciples to him and said, If anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him renounce himself and take up his cross and follow me. For anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. But anyone who loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. What gain then is it for a man to win the whole world and ruin his life? And indeed, 
What can man offer in exchange for his life? For if anyone in this adulterous and sinful generation is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, I tell you solemnly, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to New Beginnings. The first Christians experienced the encounter with Christ as so inside-outing that they compared it with being born again. Christian institutions need such rebirth and periodic renewal too, lest they fade and die. The Epistle of St. James, from which we read today, famously insists on a living faith, a faith lived in deeds. For James, a purely private faith, never taken for a public outing in deeds, is useless. Useless to the agent because it's of doubtful authenticity, and useless to the onlookers, unpersuaded by pure theory. Faith and deeds must work hand in glove, James insists. If we are to be people of integrity and agents of conversion. No wonder Martin Luther, with his insistence on the purity of justification by faith alone, dubbed James's the epistle of straw and wanted it excised altogether from the New Testament. But James's argument is more complex than first appears. It's not just a matter of consistent performative utterance. No, he takes a decidedly metaphysical turn saying that faith without works is like a soul separated from the body, quite dead. Just as the soul is invisible and ineffectual without the body, so is faith without works. Indeed, without deeds to embody it, faith can be a mere phantom. Loud professions of faith never concretized in worship, or grand pledges of ideals never demonstrated in service, are increasingly vacuous. But the converse is true also. Endless charity work or social justice activity without sound principles informing it will degenerate into activism, haphazard, sterile, exhausted. So for James, faith and deeds 
need each other. As surely as the body needs a soul and the soul a body. Now, something similarly hylomorphic might be said about a university and its vice chancellor. A university without a VC as the head mediating and serving the soul might survive for a time in a somewhat vegetative state. But without this unifying and guiding principle, its identity will fade, its purposes be confused, its members disintegrate. So we are very pleased to have a Vice-Chancellor to lead us forward anew. Professor Francis Campbell comes highly recommended by people I trust in the ecclesiastical and academic scenes in Britain. They also say that they would curse me if we Australians poached him. So I think it is no accident that his advent in these parts was augured by fire and smoke, drought and storms. This is clearly the result of British curses. Nonetheless, we are excited to welcome this student of Queen's, Leuven and Penn, this Fellow of St Edmund's, Cambridge, this distinguished Vice-Chancellor of St Mary's, Twickenham. His experience of academic life and leadership will be invaluable as he assumes his new task. But given that he will be dealing with administrators, staff and students on the Fremantle, Broome and Broadway Darlinghurst Sydney campuses, with three clinical schools in Greater Sydney, one in Werribee, Melbourne and several more in rural Australia, with multiple Catholic education officers and healthcare providers and others as clients, and with other tertiary institutions, Catholic or secular, as rivals or collaborators, his diplomatic experience may prove at least as valuable. Francis has worked with the European Commission, the United Nations, and the British Embassy to Rome, and as Deputy High Commissioner to Pakistan and Ambassador to the Holy See. He's also been a policy advisor and then private secretary to a prime minister. This government experience will hold him in good stead when dealing with Commonwealth and state education ministers and their departmental officials, as well as bishops with all their complexities. Here in Sydney, where the campus grew so rapidly and achieved so much in a decade, I'm confident that early momentum can be recovered. As there are many unrealised opportunities for the university and for greater service to young people, the church and community. We are delighted to hear that the new Vice-Chancellor will have bases in the West and the East and divide his time between them. And we're confident he'll have much to contribute, not just to the university, but to our wider church and community. New beginnings then, for the university and for Professor Campbell, as he to some extent informs its life and it to some extent embodies his. But of course, universities need more than charismatic personalities at the helm. Without what the Old Testament calls wisdom and the New Testament mostly calls faith, universities risk becoming information dispensaries or worse, research point factories or worst of all, degree mills without a deeper sense of what it's all for. 
As a 19th century Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard put it, a human being can resort to wherever he thinks there is some truth to be had for the sole purpose of learning to expound it so that his music box may add this piece to its repertoire. But as for doing anything about it, the thing never even occurs to him. True learning, he insisted, must be informed by a deeper purposefulness and enacted in meaningful deeds. Emblazoned across the biblical page on the Notre Dame crest are the words in principio erat verum. In the beginning was the word. In harking back to the beginning of creation, the time before time, and to the beginning of redemption, the time beyond time. The university embraces a present illuminated by that same creative and redemptive word. This was no pure spirit bereft of body, no faith thought devoid of works, no in the beginning of the new creation, the word became flesh. A baby born of a virgin who embraced the human experiences of learning and then teaching, and to put into action all that word and wisdom represented. That living word of God is the foundation of all this university does. The guiding principle that brings together divergent disciplines, not for knowledge grabbing or degree marketing, but for true learning with purpose and application. One of this university's most powerful documents, in my view, is its statement about the Catholic intellectual tradition of liberal education. You'll all know it back to front. If not, you can look it up on the web like I did. Here the university claims for itself the ancient Catholic tradition that contains a vast and rich treasury of ideas, reflections, thoughts and practices, to quote it, that inspires many higher ed providers around the world, that underpins much social action and that informs the lives of millions. It begins with the thought that faith is fully compatible with reason. So that there can be no genuine conflict between true faith and sound science. It acknowledges that people come to know that God exists by using their reason, but to know much more about him will also require faith. That people can distinguish between reality and illusion, and so can know the objective truth about the world. That morality is not simply a matter of what we like or our culture approves, but is based on some objective moral truths about human persons and their flourishing. That the foundations of morality are known by reason. For example, we should never attack human life. The truth is good and should be pursued that marriage and family are great social goods, that people have a natural right to what is necessary for their welfare. But society exists to serve the common good and has a particular duty to enable the needs of the most vulnerable from conception to old age. That prayer is a crucial activity for religious believers who pray together frequently for the happiness and salvation of all. And that it is our Christian duty to provide the works of the church humbly to all who can benefit from them. Now that is an idea of a university. 
worthy of informing its activity. But it is no easy task. There will be times when Professor Campbell feels he's living the Lord's challenge in today's gospel about standing by Christ before this sinful generation and being ready to take up our cross. At such times, he must take comfort in the promise that those who lose their life for the sake of Jesus and his gospel will save it. Indeed, it's my hope that our new Vice-Chancellor, part Irish, part British, part international man, will find a new life and home here, or homes, west and east, and discover great joy in forming the university's mission and life. As we contemplate this new beginning, we give thanks for those who've contributed so much to the growth and spirit of this seat of learning for these three decades and more and we draw on their inspiration for the future. May God bless you, Vice-Chancellor. God bless the University of Notre Dame, Australia, and all who sail in her. The Board of Trustees has resolved that Professor Francis Campbell will be installed as the University of Notre Dame Australia's fourth Vice-Chancellor. Professor Campbell, do you accept this charge? I do. The Apostolic Constitution Ex Corde Ecclesiae states a Catholic university pursues its objectives through its formation of an authentic human community animated by the spirit of Christ. The source of its unity springs from a common dedication to the truth, a common vision of the dignity of the human person, and ultimately, the person and message of Christ, which gives the institution its distinctive character. As a result of this inspiration, the community is animated by a spirit of freedom and charity. It is in this freedom that I now invite Professor Francis Martin Campbell to make a public profession of his faith. I, Francis Martin Campbell, with firm faith believe and profess each and everything that is contained in the symbol of faith, namely, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With firm faith, I also believe everything contained in the Word of God, whether written or handed down in tradition, which the Church, either by solemn judgment or by the ordinary and universal magisterium, sets forth to be believed as divinely revealed. I also firmly accept and hold each and everything definitively proposed by the Church regarding teaching on faith and morals. Moreover, I adhere with religious submission of will and intellect to the teachings which either the Roman Pontiff or the College of Bishops enunciate when they exercise their authentic magisterium, even if they do not intend to proclaim these teachings by a definitive act. Professor Francis Martin Campbell, the Church and the world has great need for your witness and of your capable, free and responsible contribution. I invite you now to give your oath of fidelity in accord with the provisions of Canon 833 of the Code of Canon Law. I, Prontius Marcin McLaughmile, in assuming the office of Vice-Chancellor of the University of Notre Dame, Australia, promise that in my words and in my actions, I shall always preserve communion with the Catholic Church. With great care and fidelity, I shall carry out the duties incumbent on me toward the Church, both universal and particular, in which, according to the provisions of the law, I have been called to exercise my service. In fulfilling the charge entrusted to me in the name of the Church, I shall hold fast to the deposit of faith in its entirety. I shall faithfully hand it on and explain it, and I shall avoid any teachings contrary to it. I shall follow and foster the common discipline of the entire Church, and I shall insist on the observance of all ecclesiastical laws, especially those contained in the Code of Canon Law. With Christian obedience, I shall follow what the bishops as authentic doctors and teachers of the faith declare, or what they, as those who govern the Church, establish. I shall also faithfully assist the diocesan bishops so that the apostolic activity, exercised in the name and by mandate of the Church, may be carried out in communion with the Church. So help me God and God's holy gospels on which I place my hand.
Almighty God, we give you thanks for the many and varied ways you build up your church and for the particular gift of leadership. Bless Francis Martin Campbell with your wisdom and courage as he assumes the responsibility of Vice-Chancellor of the University of Notre Dame, Australia. Grant that through his vision and direction he may be of service to the church and bring honour and glory to your name. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Through your example and your commitment both to Catholic education and to the church in the modern world, we, the Chancellor, the staff, and the students of the university welcome your leadership in all our endeavors. May God preserve you in his presence, and together may we be heralds of the joy and hope that characterize the Christian vocation. And may the joy of the gospel be our inspiration and our daily challenge. To the praise of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, as we prepare for the coming of the penitential season of Lent, let us earnestly put our prayers before our God. For the Church, especially for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Archbishop Anthony, bishops, priests, and all those who minister to God's people, that they remain faithful to God's love and will every day. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our university, that we proudly bear Our Lady's name, Notre Dame, and be inspired by her example. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our newly inaugurated Vice-Chancellor, Professor Francis Campbell, that God may watch over him, guide him in his decisions, be with him in times of struggle and success, inspire his thoughts, and keep him faithful in his service to the church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all in our university community, that our search for knowledge and truth through study prayer and work will help bring about the truth and peace of God's kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For each of us here present, that in God's image and likeness, we may respect and defend the supreme dignity of human life from conception to natural death. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our dearly departed staff and students, that may they enter into the heavenly kingdom and rejoice forever. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, your will for mankind is that none should be lost and all should be saved. Hear the prayers of your people. Guide the course of the world in your peace and let your church serve you in tranquility and joy through Christ our Lord. Um.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May this oblation, O Lord, we pray, cleanse and renew us, and may it become for those who do your will the source of eternal reward, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father most holy. Through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your word through whom you made all things, whom you sent as our Saviour and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. He stretched out his hands and he endured his passion so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so, with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory, as with one voice we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant, Terry and Richard, my assistant bishops, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, for they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and Blessed Joseph, her spouse, 
your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sextus, Cornelius, uh, Corinthians, uh, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damien, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which shall be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest, Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercy, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, 
Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints, admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours for ever and ever. At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only so the word of my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Having fed upon these heavenly delights, we pray, O Lord, that we may always long for that food by which we truly live, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening, Your Grace, Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Just as Saint Joseph was guided by dreams inspired by God to safeguard the welfare and reputation of our Lord Jesus Christ and Our Lady, so too was the dream of the University of Notre Dame, Australia. This was first and foremost due to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but also through the cooperation and commitment of all those who contributed to its establishment in 1989 and her history since then. With the inauguration of Professor Campbell as Vice-Chancellor, we begin a new and exciting chapter in the story of Our Lady's University. And so, on behalf of the students, faculty and staff of Notre Dame, I would like to present Professor Campbell with this mosaic. This mosaic is a symbol of the novena we have prayed over the last nine days to Saint Joseph, to ask for his intercession and protection over you as you begin this mission at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. Thank you and welcome Professor Campbell. Just before our final blessing, could I thank you all uh, for your presence and participation in this Mass today. Obviously, all the leadership and staff and students of the University, but also many of you, the friends of the University, all of us delighting in our new Vice-Chancellor. And I must say, of all presents you could possibly give the Vice-Chancellor, a novena of prayers to St Joseph is the most creative and spiritually worthy one that I have heard. Well done, students of Notre Dame. We're very proud of you. And to all of you, their faculty and the leaders of the university, well done for producing such fine students. God bless you all. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God.